How's your mother? By Simon Brett. Humphrey Partridge stood by the open door of the second bedroom. There was a smile on his lips as he looked at the empty bed. It's all right, mother. Just the post. Humphrey Partridge called from the bottom of the stairs as he opened the door to the village postman. There's a package for you, Mister Partridge," said Reg Carter, putting his hand on the door. "From a garden centre, it says on it, roses, I think." "Yes," said Partridge, trying to close the door. "It's the right time of year for planting roses, is it? November?" "Yes." "How's your mother?" Reg went on. He was in no hurry to leave. Not so bad. She never seems to get any letters, does she? No. Well, when you reach that age, most of your friends are dead. Oh, how old is she now? She was eighty-six last July. That's a good age. She doesn't go out much, does she? No, not at all. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to leave to catch my train to work. Partridge closed the door, and called up the stairs. Goodbye, mother. I'm off to work. On his way to the station, he stopped at the village shop to get his newspaper. Good morning," said Mister Denton, the shopkeeper. How's the old lady? Oh, not too bad, thank you, for her age, that is. Oh, Mister Partridge," said Missus Denton. "There's going to be a meeting in the village hall on Sunday about." I'm sorry, Missus Denton. I don't like to leave my mother at weekends. I'm at work all week, you see. He hurried away. He lives for his old mother," said Mister Denton. "Well," said his wife, "she probably won't live much longer. She's been in bed ever since they moved here. And how long ago was that? Three years? Three or four? I don't know what he'll do when she dies." Someone told me that he was talking about going to live in Canada. Well, I expect she'll leave him some money. When Mrs. Denton expected something, everyone in the village soon heard about it. In his office that afternoon, Partridge was getting ready to go home when the telephone rang. Mr. Brownlow wanted to see him. He hurried to his employer's office. Humphrey, come in and sit down. Partridge sat on the edge of a chair. He was going to miss his train. Mister Brownlow said, "You know, I intended to go to Antwerp next week for the meeting." Yes. Well, I've just heard that I must go to Rome tomorrow. Parsons is ill, and I'm taking his place. So, I'd like you to go to Antwerp on Monday. Me, but what about Mister Potter? He has a more responsible position in the company. He's too busy. It will be good experience for you. So, I'll ask my secretary to change the tickets. No, Mister Brownlow. You see. It's rather difficult. What's the problem? It's my mother. She's very old, and I look after her. Oh, it's only for three days, Humphrey, and this is important. I'm sorry. It's not possible. My mother. There was a pause. Mister Brownlow was looking annoyed. Ugh. All right then, you can go now, or you'll be late for your train. Partridge looked at his watch. 
I think I can just catch it if I hurry. Oh, that's great. His employer gave a cold smile. Mother, I'm home. It's exactly six thirty-five. I had to run for the train, but I caught it. Humphrey Partridge hurried up the stairs, went past his own bedroom, and stood by the open door of the second bedroom. There was a smile on his lips as he looked at the empty bed. It was Monday morning, and Partridge was making his breakfast. He turned on his cooker and prepared to boil an egg. It was an old cooker, but it still worked well. He looked out of the kitchen window with satisfaction. During the weekend, he had dug the garden and planted all the roses. The doorbell rang. It was Reg Carter, the postman, with a big package in his hand. <sighs> Sorry, I couldn't get this through the letterbox. Partridge could see that it contained more information about Canada. He would enjoy reading that on the train. Oh, and there's this letter too, but nothing for the old lady. Is she all right today? Fine, thank you. Partridge managed to shut the door behind the postman. He opened the letter. When he saw what was in it, he sat down at the bottom of the stairs, feeling weak with shock. He had won a large sum of money in a competition. You wanted to see me, Partridge. Yes, Mister Brownlow. Well, be quick then. I've just flown back from Rome. I've come to tell you I'm leaving. You mean you want to leave the company? This is sudden. Yes, I'm going abroad, to Canada, with my mother. Well, you can go in a month. I need a month's notice. Is it possible for me to go sooner? Mister Brownlow suddenly lost his temper. Ah,、uh, yes, go today. Partridge got home before lunch, feeling pleased. He had telephoned a man who had agreed to sell the house for him, and he had completed the forms necessary for living in Canada. He opened his front door and called out, "Hello, mother, I'm home." He stopped suddenly, as he saw Reg Carter coming out of his kitchen. Good God, what are you doing here? I was passing the house, and I saw the smoke. How did you get in? I had to break a window. I've called the police. I explained it all to Sergeant Wallace. Partridge's face was white. Explained what? About the fire. There was a fire in your kitchen. You left the cooker on, and the curtains were on fire. I was thinking of your mother upstairs, not able to move. So I put the fire out. Oh, thank you. That was very good of you. Then I wanted to see if she was all right. I went upstairs. All the doors were closed. I opened one, your room, I think. Then I opened another. There was a bed there, but there was no one in it. No. There was no one anywhere. The house was empty. Yes. The postman stood there, looking at him. I thought that was rather strange, Mister Partridge. You told us your mother lived here. She does. I mean, she did. She died. Died? When? You said this morning when I asked. She died two days ago. His face was red now. I'm sorry. I can't think straight. 
It's the shock, you know. I see, Reg Carter said quietly. Well, I must go now. It was about a week after the fire. Of course, Reg Carter had talked to Mr and Mrs Denton, and they had talked to almost everyone who came into the shop. Sergeant Wallace, the village policeman, had heard a lot of strange stories about Humphrey Partridge, so now he had decided to go and talk to him himself. Partridge opened the door slowly, and the sergeant went straight into the sitting room. It was full of boxes. You're packing your books, I see, Mr Partridge. When are you going to Canada? In about a month. And you're going to buy a house there, I hear. Yes. You're going alone. Your mother's not with you now. No, she... she died. Yes, that's what I want to discuss. As you know, this is a small place, and most people take an interest in other people's business. I've been hearing some strange things about you. People are saying you killed your mother to get her money. That's stupid. It's not true. Perhaps... Let me ask you a few questions. First, when did your mother die? Ten days ago, the 11th. Are you sure? The 11th was the day you had the fire. Uh, sorry, two days before that. It was such a shock. Of course. And so the funeral was on the 10th? Sometime about then, yes. It's strange that none of the local funeral directors know anything about it. I... I use someone from town. I see. And was it a doctor from town who signed the document saying that she was dead? Uh, yes. Do you perhaps have a copy of the document? Partridge looked unhappy. You know, I don't. I'm afraid, the sergeant said, that that suggests there may be something unusual about your mother's death. Now... If a crime has taken place... No crime has taken place, Partridge cried. I haven't got a mother. I never saw my mother. She left me when I was six months old and I grew up in a children's home. Then who was living upstairs? Nobody. I live alone. I always have lived alone. I hate people. People are always asking you questions. They want to come into your house, take you out for drinks. I can't stand it. I just want to be alone. Sergeant Wallace tried to stop him, but now Partridge couldn't stop. But people don't allow you to be alone. You have to have a reason. So, I invented my mother. I couldn't do things. I couldn't see people because I had to get back to my mother. I even began to believe in her and talk to her. She never asked questions. She just loved me and was kind and beautiful. Now you've all killed her. Sergeant Wallace took a moment to organise this new information. So, you're telling me there never was any mother. You didn't kill her because she wasn't here. 
Hmm. And how do you explain that you suddenly have enough money to go to Canada and buy property? I won a competition. I got the letter on the morning of the fire. That's why I forgot to turn the cooker off. I was so excited. I see. Sergeant Wallace got up and moved across to the window. You've been digging the garden, I notice. Yes, I put those roses in. You plant roses when you're going away, hmm? A few days later, there was exciting news in the village. Partridge had been put in prison, and the police had dug up his garden, and taken up part of the floor in his house, but they hadn't found a body. Then the news came that he had been freed. It seemed that his strange story to Sergeant Wallace was true. There had been no one else living in the house. He had won a large amount of money, and Partridge's mother was living in Liverpool, and had been in trouble with the police on several occasions. Partridge came back to his house, and continued preparing for his move to Canada. Two days before he was going to leave, in the early evening, someone rang his doorbell. It was December, dark and cold. All the villagers were inside their houses. He did not recognize the woman standing on the doorstep. She was dressed in the clothes of a young woman, but her face was old. "Hello, Humphrey," she said. Who are you? He held the door, ready to close it. The woman laughed. <laughs> no, I don't expect you to recognise me. You were very young when we last met. You're not. Yes, I am. Don't you want to give your mother a kiss? She pushed her painted face towards him. And Partridge stepped back into the hall. The woman followed him in. She looked at the packing cases. Of course, you're going away. Canada, is it? I read about it in the paper. I read about the money too. What do you want? Said Partridge. I've just come to see my little boy. I was thinking, perhaps you should help your poor old mother now. You never did anything for me. You left me. That was a long time ago. Now I want you to look after me in my old age. Why don't you take your old mother to Canada with you? But you aren't my mother. He spoke quietly. Oh yes, I am, Humphrey. My mother is beautiful and kind. She is nothing like you. You are not my mother. His hands were on her shoulders, shaking her. I'm your mother, Humphrey. She was laughing at him. His hands moved to her neck to stop her words. They became tighter and tighter as he shook her. He opened his hands, and the woman's body fell to the floor. Her mouth opened, and her false teeth dropped out. Next morning, Humphrey Partridge went to the police station to see Sergeant Wallace. Good morning, Mister Partridge. What can I do for you, Sergeant? About my mother, I just wanted to tell you that I did kill her. Oh yes, and then you buried her in the garden. Yes, 
I did. <sighs> Fine. I'm telling you, I murdered someone, Partridge said. Listen, Mr. Partridge, said the sergeant. I'm very sorry about what happened. And you can have a little joke if you like. But now I have other things to do, so... You mean I can just go? Do, please. To Canada? Anywhere you like. All right, then. I'll go. He left the police station. Outside, Humphrey Partridge took a deep breath of air and smiled. Right, mother. We're going to Canada, he said. Story 4 At the Old Swimming Hole by Sara Paretsky The woman in lane 2 seemed to be having problems. What was wrong? The water around her was turning red. I was sitting on a wooden seat at the University of Illinois indoor swimming pool and I was not enjoying myself. The air was hot and wet, the seats were hard and the noise was terrible. Shouts from the swimmers, the officials and the public were making my head ache. I had come to watch a swimming competition organised by Chicago businesses to collect money for sick people. A number of companies had sent teams. My old school friend, Alicia Dauphine, was in the Berman Airplanes team and she had asked me to come and watch her swim. I came because she was an old friend, though we didn't often meet now, as we had different interests. At school, Alicia was interested in only two things, swimming and engines. She studied engineering at university, and then she joined Berman Airplanes Company and worked on the design of planes. And me? I'm a private detective. My business is crime. Six competitors were standing at the end of the pool, ready to start the first women's event. From where I sat, it wasn't easy to recognise Alicia. I knew she was wearing a red swimsuit, but there were three swimmers in red. The pool was divided into seven lanes. My programme said that Alicia was in lane two. The woman in the first lane was complaining about something. The organiser changed the swimmers' positions, leaving the first lane empty. Now one red suit was in lane two, one in lane three and one in lane six. I didn't know which one was Alicia. The starting gun was fired and six bodies threw themselves into the water. There was a perfect start in lane six. <laughs> that must be Alicia. The woman in lane two seemed to be having problems. What was wrong? The water around her was turning red. I pushed through the crowd to the side of the pool, kicked off my shoes and jumped in. I swam under the water to the second lane and pulled the woman to the edge where someone lifted her out. No, it wasn't Alicia. I shouted to an official to telephone for an ambulance and knelt down beside the woman. The blood seemed to be coming from her back, below her left shoulder. She was breathing, but then the breathing changed to coughing. By the time the ambulance men arrived to take her to hospital, her breathing had stopped. It was two hours later, and I was still in my wet clothes. Sergeant McGonagall had come from the city police to question the witnesses to the murder. He had already talked to the officials, who had the best view of the pool, and now he was talking to me, Victoria V.I. Wachowski. He knew me already, of course. I told him about my part in the events. 
Before leaving him, I asked what he had learned about the dead woman. Her name was Louise Carmody, he said. She was twenty-four, and she worked for the Dearborn Bank. Nobody knew of any enemies. Alicia was waiting for me in the hall. She looked worried. Can we talk? She said. After I put on some dry clothes, we went back together to my apartment, and I had a hot bath. When I joined her in the living room, she was watching television. No news yet, she said. Who was the dead girl? Louise Carmody from Dearborn Bank. Did you know her? No, I didn't. Did the police know why she was shot? Not yet. What do you know about it? Nothing. Will they put her name on the news? Probably, if her family has been informed. Why is this important to you, Alicia? Oh, no special reason. She looked very anxious. I didn't believe her. She was hiding something. Alicia, do you know who did the shooting? At first, you were in lane two. Then they changed the swimmers' positions, and nobody knew who was in which lane. I think they were shooting at you, not Louise. Who wants to kill you? No one! She shouted. She was silent for a minute. Then she said, "Sorry, it was just such a shock. I'll try to control myself." Good. I'll get some supper. I came back with some food, but Alicia didn't want any. She was watching the local news, and her face was white. The swimming pool murder was the top story, and the name of the dead woman was given. After that, Alicia didn't say much. She asked if she could spend the night with me. She lived an hour's drive out of town. I left her in the sitting room and went to bed. I was still angry that she didn't want to talk to me. The telephone woke me at two thirty a.m. A male voice asked for Alicia. I don't know who you're talking about, I said. If you don't want to wake her, give her this message. She was lucky yesterday. We want the money by twelve o'clock, or she won't be so lucky a second time. I heard the sound of the telephone being put down. Then I heard another similar sound, the telephone in my living room. I got there just as the apartment door was shutting. Alicia had heard the message, and now she was running away. I could hear her feet on the stairs. I woke up at eight with a bad cold, the result of sitting around in wet clothes, and I was anxious about Alicia. She had clearly borrowed a very large sum of money from someone, if he was ready to kill her. But who? I telephoned her office. The secretary said she was sick and was staying at home. I tried her home telephone. No answer. Alicia had one brother, Tom, who worked for an insurance company. When I spoke to him, he said he hadn't heard from Alicia for weeks. Their father in Florida hadn't heard from her either. In Chicago, there are some big criminal groups. Two years before. I had given some help to Don Pasquale, the leader of one of them. Now he might be able to help me. I telephoned Ernesto, who works for him. Did you hear about the murder of Louise Carmody at the university swimming pool last night? She was probably shot by mistake. They wanted to kill Alicia Dauphine, who is an old friend of mine. She has borrowed a lot of money from someone. I thought you might know something about it, Ernesto. I don't know her name, Wachowski. I'll ask around and let you know. I couldn't think where Alicia was hiding. Perhaps she was in her own house, but 
not answering the telephone. I decided to go and have a look. Her house in Warrenville is near the local school. I left my car outside the school and walked to the house, past a field where some boys were playing football. Her car was in the garage, but I couldn't see any sign of life in the house. A cat came out of the trees towards me. It seemed to be hungry. I went round to the back, and there I found that someone had broken in through the kitchen window. Oh, why hadn't I brought my gun with me? My cold had affected my brain. Feeling nervous, I climbed through the window, and the cat followed me. In the kitchen and the living room, everything was tidy. And in Alicia's study, her computers and electronic equipment were all in place. Clearly, the person who broke in had not come to steal things. Had he come to attack Alicia? I went upstairs, followed by the cat. There was no one in any of the rooms. As I began to go down the stairs again, I heard a strange sound. Where was it coming from? I realised it was above me. In the ceiling, there was a square hole with a wooden cover, leading to the space under the roof. Someone was pushing back the cover. An arm came down, and the arm was holding a gun. I ran down the stairs, two at a time. A heavy noise, someone jumping down to the floor, the sound of the gun being fired, and a pain in my left shoulder. I fell the last few steps to the bottom, but managed to stand up and get to the door. Then I heard the angry cry of the cat, the shout of a man, and a loud crash that sounded like someone falling downstairs. As I opened the door, the cat rushed past me. She had saved my life. I walked with difficulty to the road, where the boys playing football saw me and came to help. The man with the gun escaped, but they got me to a hospital. There a young doctor took the bullet out of my shoulder. My thick winter coat had saved me from serious damage. They put me to bed, and I was happy to stay there. When I woke, there was a man in a suit sitting beside the bed. Miss Wachowski? I'm Peter Carlton, FBI. He showed me his card. I know you're not feeling well, but I must talk to you about Alicia Dauphine. Where is she? We don't know. She went home with you after the swimming competition yesterday. Is that correct? So, the FBI were following her. Why are you interested in her? He didn't want to tell me. He only wanted to know exactly what Alicia had said to me. Finally, I said, Mr. Colton, you tell me why you're interested in Alicia, and I'll tell you if I know anything connected with that interest. He spoke slowly. We believe she has been selling Defence Department secrets to the Chinese. No! I said. She wouldn't do that. Some of her designs for plain parts are missing. She's missing. And a Chinese businessman is missing. The designs may be in her home. They could be on a computer disc. She does all her work on computer. He told me they had looked through all her computer material at home and at work and had found nothing. I told him everything Alicia had said. And I told him about the attack on me. Perhaps the man hiding in her house had stolen the discs. He didn't believe me. I was getting tired, and asked him to leave. Next morning, both my cold and my shoulder were much better. The doctors agreed that I could leave hospital. When I got home, I telephoned Ernesto 
about Alicia. He told me she had borrowed seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars from Art Smolensk. Art Smolensk, the king of gambling. I didn't think Alicia was a gambler, but I didn't know her well these days. The telephone rang. It was Alicia talking against a background of noise. I saw the news. Thank God you're safe, Vic. Don't worry about me. I'm all right. She put the telephone down before I could ask her anything. Where was she? I thought about the noises in the background. They seemed familiar, from a long time ago. Suddenly, I remembered. It was the sports hall of our old high school, and the swimming teacher, Miss Finley, was a close friend of Alicia's. The school is in a poor part of South Chicago. There was a guard at the entrance. I showed her my detective's card, and said I needed to see the girl's swimming teacher. She let me in, and I found my way to the sports hall, where a lot of girls in orange shirts were doing exercises. Then I walked through the changing rooms to the swimming pool. When I was at school, we called it the old swimming hole. A few students, boys and girls, were swimming up and down. Alicia was sitting on a chair by the wall, looking at the floor. I joined her. Vic, she looked frightened. Are you alone? Yes, I'm alone. What are you doing here? I'm helping Miss Finley with the swimming. She teaches Spanish too, and she's very busy. Is something wrong, Vic? You are in deep trouble. Smolensk is looking for you, and so is the FBI. You can't hide here forever. The FBI. She really seemed shocked. What do they want? Your designs. They're missing, and the FBI think you sold them to the Chinese. I took the discs home on Saturday evening. Oh my God! I must get out of here before someone finds me. Where can you go? The FBI and Smolensk are watching all your friends and relations. Tom too. She was starting to cry. Especially Tom. Alicia, tell me everything. I need to know. I've already been shot once. She told me. Tom was the gambler. He had lost everything he owned, but he still couldn't stop. Two weeks ago, he had gone to his sister for help. I have to help him. You see, our mother died when I was thirteen. And he was six. I looked after him, and got him out of trouble. I still do. But how does Smolensk have your name? Is that the man Tom borrowed money from? Tom uses my name sometimes. And the designs. Tom came to dinner on Saturday, and he went into the study. I guess he took the discs I had been using, thinking they might be valuable. He knows that my company does a lot of work for the government. It was a gamble, and a gamble that he could sell them before I found out. Alicia, you can't be responsible for Tom forever. I think we should call the FBI. At this point, Miss Finley came in. She was surprised to see me. Have you come to help Alicia? She said. I found she knew most of the story. She thought it would be wrong for Alicia to tell the FBI about her own brother. They went off together. After some time, I went to look for them, and found Alicia alone in an office. Miss Finley's teaching a Spanish class, she said. Listen, the important thing is to get those discs back. 
I called Tom, and he agreed to bring them here. I told him I would help him with the money. She didn't understand. She didn't see that if the Chinese businessman had left the country, he would have the discs with him. Tom had sold her discs. He no longer had the material. Where is he meeting you? At the pool. Now please, you go to Miss Finley's class and I'll meet him at the pool. She agreed in the end, but she refused to let me call the FBI. I must talk to Tom first. It may all be a mistake. I sent the students out of the pool area and put a notice on the door saying it was closed. I turned out the lights and sat down in a dark corner, my gun in my hand. At last, Tom came in through the boys' changing room. Ali! Ali! he called. A minute later, another man joined him. He looked like one of Smolent's group. He spoke softly to Tom. Then they went to look in the girls' changing room. When they returned, I had moved towards the doors to the main part of the school. Tom! I called. It's V.I. Wachowski. I know the whole story. Give me the discs. His friend moved his arm. I shot at him and jumped into the water. His bullet hit the place where I had been standing. Another bullet hit the water by my head. I went under the water again. As I came up, I heard Alicia's voice. Tom, why are you shooting at Vic? Stop it! There were some more shots, but not at me. I got to the side of the pool and climbed out. Alicia lay on the floor. Tom stood there silently while his friend pushed more bullets into his gun. I ran to him, caught his arm, and stepped as hard as I could on his foot. But Tom, Tom was taking the gun from him. Tom was going to shoot me. Drop that gun, Tom Dolphine! It was Miss Finley, who taught difficult boys in a rough school. Tom dropped the gun. Alicia lived long enough to talk to the FBI. Tom told his story to the police. He had wanted Smolensk to kill his sister before she said anything about him. Then the world would think she had sold her country's secrets. The FBI arrived five minutes after the shooting stopped. They had been watching Tom, but not closely enough. They were angry that Alicia had been killed while they were on the case. So they said her death was my fault. I hadn't told them where Alicia was. I spent several days in prison. It seemed like a suitable punishment, just not long enough.